So we're going to move right on to our next speaker. Um, Dr. Patricia Lester is the Jane and Mark Nathanson Family Professor of Psychiatry and the Director of the UCLA Division of Population Behavioral Health in the UCLA Semmel Institute. She also serves as the Director of the Nathanson Family Resilience Center and the Medical Director of the UCLA Stress, Trauma, and Resilience Service. A child and adolescent psychiatrist, Dr. Lester's work has been dedicated to the development, research, and implementation of family-centered prevention and treatment for children and families facing illness and adversity. Please welcome Dr. Lester to the stage. Thanks. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Becker, for the introduction. And this is a great sequence because um, I think the talk that Dr. Holmes just gave uh, sets up some of the things I was going to talk about and, and provides a beautiful background. Um, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and as you just heard, I, my uh, work has really been focused on uh, bringing behavioral health practices to families and kids and populations at high risk uh, in the community as well as in the health setting. What we've been able to do through some of this work is develop an, a range of technology-based strategies that inform and enhance that work, and I'm going to share some of that with you today. And we've been able to bring some of it into the UCLA health system over the last few years, and I'll be able to show you some of those tools. So we have uh, a newly developed and partnered uh, Division of Population Behavioral Health that's focused on bringing collaborative care models in partnership with primary care and chronic care in the UCLA health system. Um, I've worked to develop that with leadership within primary care and it includes consultation, translational research, a behavioral health training institute, as well as the development of innovative technology platforms that advance those efforts. So you saw a, a nicer image of the triple aim. Our work is really anchored around advancing the triple aim um, in terms of population behavioral health. Our goal is to mitigate risk and promote psychological well-being in our patients. Um, and we're, our goals are to do this through embedded screening for depression, anxiety, PTSD, substance use risk, and provide customized early intervention. The goal here is to address people's stress before it reaches a level necessarily of diagnostic treatment. Um, and we, we do this by integrating the screening practice and early intervention into systems of care, and I'll show you a little bit about how we've done that in a variety of settings. Um, we also believe that uh, not only is the patient experience central, but the family experience is central, not only in pediatric care, but also in adult care. Families are critical to the well-being of our patients, and by targeting uh, interventions that support families' wellness, we're likely to improve our patients' wellness. And we have decades of research showing that that's true in of pediatric populations, but also quite a bit in adult populations, but we rarely set up our systems to provide that kind of care. And then, of course, the goal of reducing costs. Um, I'll show you a little bit about how we propose to reduce costs by catching uh, behavioral health risk early and bringing uh, mobile technology platforms and sort of lower cost uh, interventions to people where they live um, so that they have less burden on the system. We do this using uh, the IOM prevention framework, and I just ask you to look at this, to think about this in terms of a behavioral health practice. We're pretty good at universal prevention strategies, and we're very good at treatment. Um, I think our systems are less set up to provide selective and indicated prevention, such as the embedded wellness program inside a chronic disease model, um, but also in, our, in the communities. We have a great trouble uh, getting people to come to care or engage in behavioral health interventions early. So we really targeted our work at that selective and indicated prevention group with the idea, and this is, this is from my work in the military, to get people back to the green. So we, we don't want people in the red, we want to get them back to the green. It's a, it's 
sort of that simple. Uh, this is, uh, for those of you who are familiar with social ecological models, this is, helps us to think about patients embedded in a family system and all the systems that that patient and family touch that we have the opportunity to strengthen, to promote well-being, to enhance resilience by targeting our uh, interventions outside the healthcare system as well as inside the healthcare system. An example would be in uh, pediatric practice screening not only for child stress uh, but also for parental depression with the opportunity to intervene uh, at that early point. So to think about how we use technology to advance some of these goals, uh, I'm going to share with you a cloud-based behavioral health screening and data management system that we built to support personalized delivery, quality improvement, case management as well as fidelity to evidence-based practice, which is a, a difficult task when one rolls out evidence-based behavioral health practice into communities of care. We often lose the robust uh, outcomes that we see in research models, and this program has helped to sustain those. Um, the technology platforms we've used have been initially really around engagement and opportunities for people to learn and practice skills where they live. And we've done this in a number of fun and gaming ways that we developed in partnership with communities, families, and kids. <coughs> and these platforms, we believe, give systems of care, schools, uh, primary care settings, tools uh, to do this in a low-cost way. And then finally, I'm going to present to you a new model that we're currently in the field uh, doing a randomized trial on using multiple data sources and analytics to refine clinical decision making through a clinical mobile app for PTSD. And again, this is just a frame to help think about where in a continuum of care model uh, we want to embed uh, mobile tools and applications. So there's mobile tools for screening and then there's ones for education and online behavioral interventions that can be um, sustained with lower cost provider support or can be totally self-care driven, although I think there's some problems with that that we could talk about. And then finally, you know, when people need to be involved in, uh, in provider-led interactions. So the first example I'm going to talk about is something called the FOCUS program. FOCUS is an acronym uh, for a family-based intervention that we've done that's CBT-based, uh, uh, evidence-based practice that we adapted for military populations early in the war. We knew that children, uh, service members, and their spouses were all having higher rates of depression, anxiety, the kids were having a lot of behavioral problems. Uh, there was a comprehensive effort at the level, level of the federal government to say uh, this is not good for our service members to go off to war, but it's also not good for our families. So there was an opportunity to both do intervention for service members, but also prevention for their families. Um, we adapted our evidence-based model with Camp Pendleton as a partner. And we were selected to roll this out. And for eight years, our team here at UCLA has run a large program uh, at 24 installations around the country in the Pacific Rim, really delivering a suite of evidence-based services, this focus model to Navy SEALs, to the Marine Corps, to sailors, uh, airmen, and soldiers in the field, and have shown very robust outcomes over time reductions in anxiety, depression, improvements in coping and pro-social skills, reaching at this point over 700,000 folks. So a large program that really needed a robust data management system to do it with any level of fidelity as well as uh, personalized care. And to do that, we adapted uh, using a commercial product called Salesforce. Uh, and integrated it with a screening survey tool, uh, Survey Gizmo, and built a screening uh, app, essentially, that not only identified risk in the population and helped us target our community-based preventive intervention, not a clinical treatment, but preclinical, um, helped us do that, but then gave clinical guidance to our providers about what to do with that particular person and family sitting in the room in front of them 
And this model that has now uh, been called the UCLA Behavioral Health Checkup has provided an innovative platform that we've been able to bring back into UCLA through the Operation Men Wounded Warrior Project and also in partnership with primary care. So this has been rolled out in the last couple of years with the Behavioral Health Associates Program. Uh, it received an Innovations Award uh, to do some of this work. And then more recently, we've been able to integrate it into Epic uh, using a cloud integrator called MuleSoft. So this is getting ready to go live uh, in the next month, but it's been tested and works. Uh, sending the screening report clinical guidance back into the system. So we're very excited about that. We've expanded it into UCLA Psychiatry, uh, as well as some external partners are using this platform too. I'll show you what it looks like. This is what a patient sees when they come in the primary care office 20 minutes early. They sit down, they do a screening tool. Uh, they like it, it's green, it's easy to do. We've, we've done evaluation of the process. And then the provider receives uh, this really lovely report giving guidance about risk areas as well as strengths across the family system. Both in the child setting, both parents and kids do it. And the data is triangulated and put into a nice little report for the provider. And then it's used as a data tracking quality improvement system over time so we can treat to target. Here's what some of the reports look like. These are ones currently being sent to provider phones, and then there's patient versions of them. So they can be printed as handout and given to the patient. But I think the comment was made earlier, patients love having information in front of them. Our providers turn the report around and review it with the patients, and it's been really helpful in guiding clinical care. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the fun engagement apps that were designed to provide education to both kids and adults, but also opportunities to learn and practice cognitive behavioral skills in problem solving, emotional regulation, and goal setting. Uh, we first designed something called Focus World, which was an avatar world. Everybody in the family got their own avatar in this 3D world, and they were able to cook up goals in the kitchen and develop emotional regulation in the steam room and emotional awareness. And then they were also able to build a narrative about their experience, even eye chat in real time. I don't have time to show you the whole focus world, but it's fun. Um, and then we also really felt that folks needed more than a web-based computer program. Uh, the military is a highly mobile population like ours. They all have smartphones. Uh, and we built an app called Focus on the Go. Again, uh, games for kids to learn and practice skills, really leveraging what we've all seen every single day, which is parents handing their phone off to their kid, and then opportunities to talk about what they're learning and to practice and enhance um, these skills across the family. Uh, these are uh, some of the screenshots of the game. I think I saw one on your table. But in this, in this app is also our behavioral health checkup, our screening tool that provides reports directly back to the family about how they're doing. Um, and then has a range of resources, modeling videos uh, for kids and their parents to watch and talk about around difficult topics, how to manage difficult behaviors. Uh, through support from the Pritzker Foundation, we adapted this for foster youth. And I'm going to show you the video, not because it's so much in a healthcare setting, but it gives you an idea of the, the, the platform and how it can be used to engage and destigmatize accessing mental health care and information. Some advice that I would give to um, you know the uh, new kids in the foster system is as a doctor, parents, I encourage you to start where the youth is. I came from a very difficult home life, and once I made it into foster care, I moved around a lot. <laughs> I think that was one of my biggest
the, the uh, focus on the Go app um, within our uh, Family Star Clinic, where we see many uh, medically ill kids. We really have made a specialty out of how they're seeing chronically ill children with uh, oncology problems, uh, our transplant patients. And it's, it's always really rewarding to see uh, the kids download this on their iPads and their phones and go, go home and come back and show their provider all the things they've done and to use it over time and hear from parents how much fun it is for them to do these kinds of skills and how it's become a conversation in their family going home and showing it to dad who couldn't come to the appointment. So you start to see how these kinds of tools can really build upon and expand what we do in a clinical setting in a way that doesn't make people feel uh, like you, you can see none of the language is really about depression or anxiety or PTSD. It's not about illness, it's about wellness and really enhancing the, the inherent strengths of our patients and our families. So the last example I'm going to talk about, um, I think connected more to uh, the earlier talk about using sensors, but in a behavioral health realm, really responds to, I think, the lack of information psychiatrists and mental health providers have um, for their patients. If you think about what we know about our patients, it's what they tell us um, in short interactions in limited settings. So one of the things that uh, mobile technology offers us is to think about gathering data in real time, both inputted data from our patients, also sensor data, but also including their caregivers. We hear over and over again uh, from uh, family members how little they know about what's going on with their uh, spouse, their adult child. This is particularly true in the veteran and military world with PTSD. And I think it's true across our health system people feel cut off from knowledge about what's going on with their loved one. And many of these people have huge responsibilities as caregivers, and they have their own care burden that they're thinking of. So our concept here was to give an app to both the caregiver and the patient, and triangulate both sensor and inputted data back into a machine learning algorithm that could be uh, shared and used for clinical decision making with a provider. Uh, we partnered with an external company called Inferlink who does machine learning computer engineers uh, and uh, manage big data and we uh, got funding from the federal government to do an initial uh, a phase of this and then now we're doing a trial uh, that's currently in the field. I just thought I'd share the platform with you because I think it really does help us think how can these tools really start to fill in the gaps of what we know and advance our ability to predictively know more about what our patients are experiencing and going to experience again particularly an issue in our field where we have so few markers about how people are doing other than self-report. I think I just shared uh, these things with you. We also do uh, tele-delivery, in-home tele-delivery, and we have some trials going around that. So uh, this, the, these mobile tools help us think about scaling behavioral health quantification monitoring. They help us reason from sparse data, but by triangulating it from multiple resources, as well as passive sensor data collection, as well as uh, matching it uh, to big data, we start to have ways to think about the larger context of our patient's experience. Uh, particularly, uh, given our family-centered approach and knowing how uh, caregiver well-being and family conflict are predictive of poor outcomes. So if you look at the suicide literature, you'll see one of the biggest predictors of completed suicides is family conflict, uh, measured in the weeks and months before uh, the event. So it's particularly important to us to include caregiver family monitoring um, and to be measuring not only their observations about the patient and the family, but about looking at their own stress level. Uh, and depression level and parenting stress. And that this was an opportunity not only for intervention, but again, prevention, these early interventions that reduce the burden on the care system. 
these, this is a, an image of what this looks like. The data gathering happens via the remote mobile app, uh, both in the hands of the caregiver and the patient. Um, the, this is enriched through uh, remote data. And then also uh, there is a period, there is statistical analysis and monitoring that then gets fed back into the clinician dashboard. But the system can learn from how the family and the patient are using the platform and begin to be refined to their needs. Uh, this is what the architecture looks like and the, the clinician get, again gets uh, dashboard output. But again, this is, this is interpreted data uh, that's gone through uh, a, an analytic phase, triangulating in all the information that's collected. And it, just to give you a sense of what that might look like, is you know, is there caregiver stress? Is there, uh, for instance, a uh, natural disaster occurring at the time? Does the family eat in the same room together? We'll know that. Are they always in the same place at the same time? Has the patient not left their house? Uh, for three weeks because they have such intense anxiety problems. So these, kind, these kinds of in, pieces of information can all be brought together uh, into a, an analytic process. So I, I guess I wanted to end by just helping us not only think about the key role for technology platforms in helping us scale high quality care and monitor outcomes and opportunities to engage families and caregivers in ways that we haven't thought of, particularly relevant to families with children with chronic disease or the caregivers of folks with dementia, for instance, or traumatic brain injury. But I also wanted to call out in all our positive enthusiasm for technology, there are some, I think, cautionary issues afoot that the technology has exceeded the research base. The, tool, the tools are way out in front of what it takes to do a biomedical validation process in terms of randomized trials. And I think we, we need to keep a balance in our minds and also pay attention to the implementation process. What is it? There's 50,000 tools out there. Uh, I, our experience and our observation and the research shows a lot of them don't get used or they get used once and they don't continue to be used. So that when we start to integrate these kinds of tools into our care systems, we really need to set up an evaluation process that helps us identify what makes them engaging to people, how do we get them to keep using them, and do they really make a difference in our care outcomes. Thank you.